Well, we can look at what we actually have to compute. So we need to take, initialize our gradient descent somewhere. We have to um, compute the gradient, evaluate the function along the line, and find the point of minimum, and then compute the next gradient and so on. So what we will definitely need, we will have to compute the gradient of our likelihood under the current parameter. And we have to evaluate the function at a few locations along the line in order to find where it is smaller than where we started. <coughs> Both of these, evaluating the function here and computing its gradient, well, we know what the function is, uh, what the functional form is, right? It's the norm of the weight vector squared, that's easy. It's something linear, multiplying the weight vector with the features, that is easy. And it's taking the logarithm of summing over all configurations of the exponential, and that is not easy. So this sum over all possible exponentials um, of all possible configurations, that is a gigantic sum, right? It's all possible um, values of all possible random variables at the same time. So this y is too large in order to actually execute. can be billions or more states. So um, we will not be able to do the compute this gradient even once if we do not make use of some additional structure that our graphical model has. And in fact, that shouldn't be surprising because none of this derivation of gradient descent used that we use a graphical model, right? We just said we have a feature function, we have a weight vector, we add them up. Nobody talked about factors and so on. Sorry? So the whole reason why we use graphical models is to avoid modeling all the possible outcomes, right? Exactly, yes. Well, we want to be able to reason about all possible outcomes without explicitly enumerating them, right? So the gradient descent by itself doesn't know that. And here, we have to sum over all of them, um, except if we can use the structure that we put into the graphical model. So the only reason, as you say, to use the graphical model is essentially this step. For a general model where everything is connected to everything and there are huge factors that depend on everything, we would not be able to compute this thing even once. Whereas for a graphical model, as we introduce them, we will actually be able to do so. Why is that? Well, we can look at what these terms really are. When we go back, um, <coughs> the gradient here, it's the sum over all the configurations of the probability of a state multiplied with the vector of that state for the given input. So that's the expected value of the feature, right? Multiply, uh, summing all for, uh, over all possible states multiplied with the probability of the states, that's exactly what the expected value of a function is. So what we have to do in order to compute the gradient is we have to be able to compute the expected value of our feature map under the current model distribution. And similarly, what was the log likelihood? What are the terms? Well, this term here, sum over all states of exponential of minus something, that's exactly the logarithm of the partition function. Right? And the partition function indeed is the sum over all possible configuration states. So if we wanted to do this naively, we would have an exponential large sum if k is the number of states and m is the number of um, variables, it's k to the power m, and then we also have to sum over all examples, and for each we do have to, I mean, do an operation on a d-dimensional feature, so it would be k to the m times n times d, just to compute the gradient once, and also during the line search we have to compute the partition function, which would be equally slow. So how can we speed this up? Well, the most important part is to get rid of this exponential part. So we cannot s sum over all things, so what do we do instead? <coughs> Well, luckily, we have set up our model not arbitrarily, but using the reasoning of graphical models. So we didn't start with a completely arbitrary feature map that contains everything, but we said this is a feature map that is derived from the small energy functions that we have for each part of our model. Um, and now this long vector is just stacking these one after the other. So certain parts of the feature vector depend only on certain of the random variables. Now what do we do if we want to compute the expectation over all variables of our feature? Well, that's the expectation of each component, right? Each component of the vector um, is, well, it's a stack of many different vectors. We compute the expectation of each of the stacked parts separately. Each of these depends only on a subset of the variables. And what in the very beginning we said, if you have an expectation over many random variables, but only some of them show up in the actual function, you can ignore all of the ones that don't show up and you only need to take expectation over the ones that do show up. So instead of expectation over everything, 
of this function, we only need to take expectation over the small um, number of variables that actually do show up in this feature function. <coughs> so if we th write this out, each of these expectation over a smaller group of random variables, it's always the number. So for each factor, you have to compute one of them. And the variables you have to uh, do this expectation over is the variables that show up in the corresponding factor. <coughs> it's the sum over all the factor, I mean, the possible configuration that this factor can take. Probability of that configuration multiplied with the feature of that configuration. The probability of these is the probability of any state of small number of random variables, which is exactly the marginal probabilities that we were able to compute in uh, probabilistic inference. In the simplest case, your factor looks just as one variable at a time. Then this is the probability of one state with all the others marginalized out. If you have factors that look at two things, it's the combination of both of them. Still, probabilistic inference was exactly designed in order to compute these probability distribution over a small number of variables with all the, no all the others ignored. <coughs> so, A, this sum is much smaller than the one we started with. It's not exponentially large. Oh, well, it's exponentially large, but in exponentially in the size of the factor instead of the whole model. So if your model has only small factors, one, two, three variables, typically you can do this sum uh, efficiently. And in fact, we can compute it using the probabilities that um, probabilistic inference will give us. Belief propagation, um, loopy belief propagation if you believe in it, variational inference for approximate sampling. These techniques will give us at least an estimate of these probabilities, which we can then use to compute this expectation, and this expectation will directly enter our gradient. So you, knowing how to do probabilistic inference allows us to compute the gradient and the function value efficiently. Yes? So uh, does it make sense in case of, for example, very densely connected character models with groups to reduce stochastic approximation for uh, gradients? Because we have an expectation there of there, we would approximate it with a why just a sum, well, a single sample, let's say, go for I don't think that will make a big difference because typically what costs time here is not the summation. Well, even if you would do the summation, you would need the values of these factor marginals. And most methods for computing these work, they don't compute one factor marginal at a time. They compute all of them in parallel. So the belief propagation, it computes the marginal probabilities of all variables individually. I mean, you run once the belief propagation, you get all the marginals out. So if you have really, really many combinations, you would invest a lot of work to get either one or all of them out, I don't think it will save you much. There is stochastic approximations to these things, but I don't think they are used here on this step very much. Maybe it's a new idea. I haven't seen it. Okay, so knowing about probabilistic inference actually pays off. It will allow us to take this exponential dependence of number of states to the number of variables in our model and break it down to only the number of um, factors or the size of the largest factor. If you have a pairwise model, it's now number of states squared, where before it might have been number of squared to a million. So that makes a big difference. <coughs> Same for the evaluation of the function. What we need there was the um, log partition function that a probabilistic inference will also give us um, a value for that, at least in some, some of the methods. Sampling actually doesn't, as far as I know because sampling the partition function cancels out, so sampling is not a good idea if you really care about the value of the function you're evaluating here. Um, but there's a few more problems. So imagine you're doing um, large-scale condition random field training. Maybe you're Facebook, um, and you have millions of training examples. In principle, that's a good thing. You want a lot of training examples. But this gradient needs to sum over all of them. So if you have a million, that means for every for every example, you have to run probabilistic inference to get all the different probabilities out. So even if it scales just linearly in the number of examples, if your number of examples is big, it will become very, very slow. And this is just one gradient step, right? So you do another gradient step, you have maybe thousands of gradient steps, it quickly adds up. <coughs> so it turns out um, this is one of the steps which can be approximated efficiently or, I mean, efficiently sped up um, by, by a stochastic method. So typically, if you have a large-scale problem with more than thousands of examples, you would not do actual gradient descent. You would sto do stochastic gradient descent. 
Um, and that it's, it's relatively easy to do. Instead of evaluating your function, which is the gradient, on all samples, you just pick a small subset of samples, in the extremes case, just one or maybe three, maybe a hundred, but not a million of them. And you compute an approximation to the gradient, which is you use the same expression as for the regular gradient. It's this linear thing. Oh, there should be a W. Ah, no, sorry, this is the gradient already. So it's the, it's the sum over all training examples. But now you choose only a small subset of them, not all of them. And to compensate for the fact that you left out a large fraction, you just multiply with the ratio of all examples over the one you pick. So if you pick only 2% of the examples for your estimating your gradient, you have to multiply the result with 50. Right? <coughs> and that will give you an approximation gradient that might not point in the right direction, but hopefully roughly in the right direction. <coughs> and in fact, um, you can see that as an, if you think of it as an estimator of the two gradient, this is an unbiased estimator of the gradient. So it will point in expectation to the right direction, even if each individual instance of it might wiggle around. Um, since we're not really pointing in the descent direction, we might have the problem that we cannot run a line search to find a, a direct, uh, the position where the function goes down because it might not go down. It might not be a direction where it's really guaranteed to go down. So typically, instead of the search along a line to find the best spot, you just do a fixed rule how wide your steps are. So you would just pick fixed step size and then always go a certain constant times the gradient, maybe just 1 times the gradient or 0.1 times the gradient. <coughs> um, the nice thing is if you start with a convex function, you do the stochastic gradient descent procedure instead of the real gradient descent procedure, it will converge to the true solution. And often it does so more efficiently, not from the optimization point of view, but from the learning point of view, you get very close to the optimal solution relatively quickly. Um, you do have to take care that your step size rule makes sense. So the steps have to go down, but not go down too quickly over time. Um, since we're not doing optimal steps, we're just doing approximate steps, we will need more steps, but each step will be much faster. So if you speed up your steps, so if you have a million of examples and you evaluate your gradient on just one instead of a million, you save a factor of a million. Um, that means if you take 1,000 times more steps, it's not a big deal. You have still gained a lot of efficiency in the end. So um, if you're interested more in this kind of stochastic gradient descent, there's a very nice overview by Leo Boutou and Olivier Boski uh, on the trade-offs of large-scale learning, which emphasize a little bit how these op stochastic optimization techniques are really, really good for learning, whereas in the optimization community, they are typically not so highly regarded because they're not a way to quickly give you a lot of digits of precision, but in learning, they are really good and very common idea, these things. <coughs> okay, so there's cases where even with uh, this... Stochastic gradient probabilistic inference will still be too expensive to run. So even if you would only have to do it for one example, it might still take a long time. Um, so what can you do? We said already that for certain models you cannot do exact inference, it would be too inefficient, but you can do approximate inference. So the first thing would be, can we do this kind of gradient percent procedure, but not with the correct expectation, but with approximate inference, for example, loopy belief propagation as a uh, optimization uh, as an inference technique. And it, it turns out that this is a bit tricky. So we know that loopy belief propagation returns only approximations to the marginals. Um, and if we compute the gradient from that, then we get an approximation to the gradient. But in contrast to the stochastic thing before, it's not an unbiased estimate. So it could be that the gradient we get from loopy BP always points 20 degrees to the left it would be a biased estimate of the true gradient. It doesn't have to be 20 degrees, just a, it's a consistent wrong direction in your gradient. And then you would always go not correctly towards the minimum, but somewhat beyond this, and there's no guarantee that you will actually find the minimum in the end. Um, <coughs> so using a non-unbiased estimator, just using any approximate gradient in this kind of iterative procedures, the error might um, accumulate and you might in the end learn something wrong without knowing why it doesn't work. So blue PBP together with gradient descent is not a very common sight. 
Um, yes, it might not even converge. That's true. Um, so what else can we do? We saw already in the in the mean field uh, variation inference example that sometimes if you have a too difficult thing like computing marginals is too difficult, it might make sense to solve a simpler problem and hope that the answer to the simpler problem is similar to the answer to the full problem. Um, so we can do the same thing for conditional random field training. Um, if our probabilistic inference is too expensive, maybe we can, I mean, this is just needed because we minimize the data likelihood. So maybe we can minimize something else that is related to the log likelihood of the data, but much easier to compute. So this is the idea of surrogate likelihoods, which are different objective functions to minimize for, or for minimizing a condition in the field. And these are very commonly used if you have a model which has many, many loops and cycles and is not easy to do probabilistic inference for. So the first one of that kind was so-called pseudo-likelihood. So pseudo-likelihood says my distribution y of x, as complex as it is, um, maybe I can approximate it with a much simpler one, which is a product of individual margin of um, conditional probabilities of one variable at a time with all the others fixed. That's a little bit like the directed model, right? Except that there it would only be the parents, and here everybody is a parent to everybody else. And because of the um, property of graphical models, we know that you can, instead of conditioning on everything else, you only need to condition on the direct neighbors in your graph. Um, that's the, the conditions of well, how the dependence in this uh, undirected model works. So you can think of this graphically as <coughs> you take your original graph, your graphical model, which has um, loops and everything is an unknown variable, and you turn it into a different model where only one variable is unknown at a time. So only this one is now unknown. The others we keep fixed. And another model where the other variable is unknown and we keep those fixed. This one is unknown and the others are fixed and so on. So we turn our one model with lots of dependencies into a large group of independent models with just one independence, uh, one independent variable at a time. Um, by itself, that might or might not be a good idea. But it turns out that if we look at the data likelihood under this factorizing model, pseudo likelihood model, uh, we can compute the log likelihood under this model and it's much easier to compute in practice. So what's the log likelihood under this model instead of the full graphical model? Um, it's the logarithm of the product of these terms, right? That's how we define the probability. Um, so because of independence and because we know, so. We have the probability over all samples multiplied, and the distribution itself is a product. So we just get summations. And what we end up with is very similar to what we saw with the, with the real conditional likelihood, right? We still have this inner product of our weight vector with the actual um, uh, feature vector of the, the observations. But what used to be the log partition function is now the sum of many tiny log partition functions. So it will be the logarithm of it's a sum over all variables here and the logarithm of a sum that is just one variable at a time so because these were pro uh, probabilities over just unknown one unknown variable the partition function will also have just a summation over one unknown variable so these we can compute in practice by just exhaustively trying the values for the uh, random variable um, so this is something that we can typically compute efficiently without any probabilistic inference we just plug in values normalize some, some up over, I mean, all states, take logarithm, the standard thing, um, as if it was logistic regression. <coughs> um, so the moment you do this pseudo-likelihood um, approximation or surrogate likelihood, you get um, a tractable optimization problem, more or less no matter what you started with. <coughs> the second thing people came up with um, there is a certain gut feeling that if you, if you look at this, what do you do? You study your labels conditioned on the other labels. And at training time, you have all the labels of your examples. So you can look at one of the labels with the others fixed. But at prediction time, you do not have any of them, right? So you cannot look at one of them with the other fixed because you don't know what the other ones are. So um, there's the idea that maybe the pseudo likelihood might have the artifact of concentrating too much 
if one label is predictive for the other. So imagine you have two labels where one is always perfectly identical to the other, then this model wouldn't have to learn anything because it can just say, oh, I know my neighbor, so I do the same. So it would just learn that neighbors are the same, but that at, in the future it wouldn't help it much because it doesn't know which state it is. Um, so there's some criticism of this model. What else can you do? So here's another decomposition of your model in a so-called piecewise um, likelihood. So you assume that your model is a product of simpler terms, but instead of saying it's the product of um, feature functions normalized with one big constant, you normalize each factor separately. So you say it's a product of terms as many as we have factors, and for each of them we do the conditional, uh, we do the probability of just this factor. So the pr probability of that this factor is the exponential of the energy function normalized. So we replace one big normalization constant by many small normalization constant. Small normalization constant we can compute, and if you think of it in terms of graphs, what we do is we take the large loopy graph and decompose it into as many small independent graphical models as we have factors by just duplicating the corresponding values. <coughs> Again, if we try to do the data likelihood of the data under this model, we get a much more tractable thing. The worst thing that will happen is that we have to sum over all configuration of individual factors, and if our factors have two or three terms at a time, this we can compute. Um, so again, we have a tractable model where the full model would have been intractable. Um, there are certain guarantees for this. You can again give some kind of bounds that the partition function of one versus the partition function of the other is um, larger. So um, sometimes that helps you to un interpret which mistakes can happen. But ultimately, it's more of an empirical thing. So if you cannot train your model exactly, you can try one of these others and see if these give you a good estimate of your data and if it gives you good predictions. So um, there's multiple. You can also combine these two instead of making these um, just random variables. You can make them one factor at a time conditioned on their neighbors. Then you have a mixture of piecewise and pseudo likelihood called piecewise pseudo likelihood. Um, and so on. You can do different things. You might decompose this into larger groups. Maybe you don't want two at a time. Maybe you want a whole chain at a time that would still be manageable to compute and so on and so on. Okay. Ah, the other nice thing about this piecewise is if you look, it's a summation over all your factors and we parameterized our energy to have one weight vector per factor. So this decomposes perfectly into a sum over objective functions one per weight vector component. So you can, for example, train this in parallel very easily. You just learn each weight vector for each of the factors separately on a different thread or so. Um, for the pseudo likelihood, there was still some interacting pieces, so there the parallelization wasn't that easy. Um, so there's a lot of aspects like this that can enter your, your consideration when you try to train. <coughs> okay, so this is the summary of how to solve conditional random field training numerically. Um, all methods that work well are based on gradient, gradient descent, and so on. Um, and that means you need to be able to compute your gradient. Um, typically, you have to exploit the structure of the model, otherwise your gradient computation will be completely intractable. Um, if you can do, belief propagation is a great thing. If not, either approximate or using pseudo-likelihood, piecewise likelihood, and so on. Um, if your number of samples is too large, stochastic gradient descent is typically a good idea. That is well established. We understand very well under which conditions, for example, on the step width it will work. Um, there's also sometimes the case where the dimension of the data is too large. I left that out. Um, but um, there's similar techniques like the, like the piecewise training where you say, okay, first I pre-train parts of my model. I fix them low dimensional and then I plug them into the conditional and field learning. Um, you can look that up in the tutorial if you're, if you're in a situation where you really bothered that your featured vector is too large, um, you can look into the tutorial text and there it's explained. Okay, so that's the summary. Um, given a conditional random field, you train it, the energy is a linear function of your parameters, the overall model is log linear, you train it by conditional like likelihood, you need probabilistic inference, 
This is on one slide everything you have to know about graphical model training um, if you cannot just do the um, counting of states. Right? Okay, that comes to the third part, and we still have some time. So, the, the one but last part was about energy minimization and map prediction. So, what does that mean? Um, given a probability like P of Y given X, we might be interested not just in finding the probability of certain parts or the probability of everything, but we might be able to identify an element that has the highest probability. Right? And that's equivalent to just minimizing the energy, as we'll see in a minute. <coughs> so similar as to probabilistic inference, um, map prediction of states um, can be done either exactly or approximately. And in fact, the techniques for both are partly similar and part one, some things you can only do with one but not the other, but some you can also do with both. Um, so we're going to talk about belief propagation again. We're going to talk about a very um, relevant special case of um, minimizing submodular energy using graph cuts. We're going to talk about integer linear programming. And then we're going to talk about um, approximate energy minimization, which is linear program relaxations, local search. And I don't think we will talk about simulated annealing. Well, maybe by accident. You can find it in the, in the tutorial. Okay. <coughs> Here's our favorite model about parts. We have a factor graph. All the parts interact. They depend on the, on the image information. Um, what would it mean to do max map prediction, maximum a posteriori prediction? It would be to find the most likely configuration of outputs for a given input. So given an input like the one on the left, give me one label, one labeling Y, so one configuration of parts, one pose, that has the highest likelihood. So it's like a decision, it's like a prediction, one output. Could be, for example, that one. If you remember the, the, the last time I showed this, you saw the marginal probabilities of parts, right? You saw like the arm is most likely here, here's a really high arm probability, there's a really low arm probability. This will just give you a point estimate, but it will be the best guaranteed. Similarly, if you have other models, you can, I mean, you can of course have more than these if you predict if you have a model that predicts many people, you will predict the outcome of many people and so on, but it will always be one configuration at a time. <coughs> so the first thing we looked at probabilistic inference was a chain, and it was belief propagation. So can we do the same trick for energy minimization, for maximizing the probability? Um, I mean, was that here somewhere? OK. So Minimizing, maximizing the probability is the same as minimizing the energy. I think we saw that before because the probability is up to a constant e to the minus energy. So if you minimize the exponent, you maximize the function itself. So these two are used interchangeably. <coughs> so how do we minimize the energy if we know that the energy comes from a graphical model? So it decomposes into a sum of as many terms as there's factors, and each factor looks only at a small number of variables at a time. So here's the example of a chain and the energy has three factors. What we need is we want to assign, uh, we want to identify yi, yj, yk, yl that have overall the smallest value of this energy function. <coughs> well, if you look at this, you will see that we can do the same trick as last time. Only now we exchange not summations with sums, uh, with products, but we s exchange minimizations with pluses. So. <coughs> the last term here um, doesn't depend on, ah, sorry, this term here doesn't depend on yk and yl, right? So for the minimization with respect to yk and yl, this is just a constant. The choice of yk and yl has really no impact on this value. So instead of minimizing over all jointly, we can move this and we move on the outer side over ya and yj, but then the result of that, we minimize over yk and yl. So we can move the minimization over these two behind that term. And in fact, the minimization over yl, we can also move over this term, which is constant with respect to yl. So what we end up with is we have to minimize <coughs> over all i and j. What do we minimize? We minimize the function that is ef of ij plus another function. And the other function is a minimum itself. It's the minimum of this term 
plus another minimization outcome. So it's like a nested sequence of minimizations that depend on a smaller subset of parts. <coughs> so what is this minimization? This function depends only on yk. It doesn't depend on yi and yj. Right? So for every fixed value of yk, we can execute this minimization and it will give us a value and we can memorize which value of yl was the one that led to the minimum. And we can call the result, this actual value of this minimum, which only depends on the value that yk had, we can call this a message. So it will be, for every state that yk can take, it will be the result of minimizing over the other variable. <coughs> so instead of writing a minimum here, we can just write a value here. Now we have the same thing as before. We minimize over yk as function that depends on yj and yk. For every fixed value of yj, this we can evaluate by just trying the values. For each value of yj, we will get a result of the minimization. So we call the result of this minimization for fixed yj r something something of yj. And we can replace the whole minimization term by the corresponding result of the minimization. And so on. And then now we have something that depends on two arguments. So we minimize it over two arguments and we should be done. Okay, that's the same steps. Um, now, if you want to know which values actually led to this um, minimum configuration, right? And in the end, we want to know which y is, uh, was responsible for this. We can go, uh, you can do a backtracking, so we know which y, 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 j it was. From that, we can identify um, which, so we know which y, j we have to plug in here. We can remember which y, k was the reason for this value for any fixed y, l. So we would go back, back, back upwards, and then eventually we have memorized for each configuration what was the best after. So again, this is a, f um, a naive way of explaining dynamic programming to you. I mean, I'm sure you know much better what dynamic programming is than, than how I could explain it. <coughs> um, and again, it's an instance of a, a message passing algorithm where we compute local things, condense them into a vector. That vector is necessary for the next operation, and so on. And that means we can do the same thing, not just for chains, we can again do it for trees. Um, and now what happens if we come to a certain location in a tree, we will not do the product of the messages as for the probabilistic inference, we will do the sum. And in the ones where um, the probabilistic inference had a, um, a matrix multiplication, now we have to do a summation, uh, a minimization over the rows of a matrix instead of the matrix vector multiplication. So what we end up with is an algorithm that is called the min sum belief propagation, or more commonly it's called max sum if we want to maximize instead of minimize, um, which essentially is the same operations as we had for the e previous belief propagation, which was uh, sum product. But now the summation is replaced by minimization and the product is replaced by summation. Um, and if you're into algebra, this is the tropical ring or so, and you can do the same thing for every ring structure. You can define a belief propagation algorithm. But these are the two that actually matter to us. Okay, the same way we can do loopy max sum belief propagation. We start with a random or constant message everywhere, and then we follow the same update rules, sending from every node to every other node the message what maximized Oh, and what was the value of maximizing me given the neighbors? Um, and as in all the other cases, we do not have convergence guarantee or optimality guarantees, even though some convergent variant exist, for example, uh, TRWS. Um, and in practice, it often does give you good results. It's not the globally optimal configuration, maybe, but as in uh, probabilistic inference, the globally optimal configuration for these is typically NP-hard. So um, you're often happy if you get a good enough uh, approximate answer. <coughs> okay, so in cyclic graphs, it's intractable to do this exactly, um, often, but not always. There's a few exceptions which, for the marginal inference, uh, there are not so many exceptions. Either you can do belief propagation or you can do this, uh, the junction tree, but you know exactly how the junction tree scales. It scales exponentially in the size of the, of the uh, it scales in the tree width. Um, for this energy minimization map prediction, 
um, there's actually several interesting cases where you can still do the maximization even though you could not do the marginalization. You could not do probabilistic inference, but you can find the maximum or minimum. So that's a very nice um, distinction between the two cases, and there's a lot of research going on into identifying them and seeing when they are useful. And the one I'm going to talk to you about is the case of so-called submodular energies, which is a very important one in discrete optimization. Um, <coughs> so we're going to talk about um, graphical models. Do I have a picture? Maybe. Yes. Um, we're going to talk about graphical models that can have loops. So imagine this has a loop. Sorry that it doesn't. Um, which have only pairwise terms. So there's no, no factors with more than two uh, units. Um, and all the variables can only have binary states. So they're either 0 or 1. And then the energy will be a sum over um, terms that only look at one variable at a time, for example, because they depend on the, on the information of the input, and terms that depend on two variables at a time, where there's one for each edge in the, in the, in the model. So it's the same kind of energy, but now only binary. And there's another constraint. And that constraint is, well, two constraints, but one is not a bad one. The one constraint that we can do without big problems, without loss of generality, uh, that these terms here are non-negative, that will not stop us much because if these are just finitely many, so if there's any of them that is, non that is negative, we just add a big constant to all of them. If we add a big constant to all of them, the, it doesn't, the minimizing configuration doesn't change, only its value. So by adding a large constant to it, we can always make the individual terms non-negative without changing the result of the minimizing configuration. The second restriction is a real restriction, and that says we cannot have arbitrary terms in these pairwise ones. We can only have so-called submodular ones. And submodular means that, remember these are binary, right? So there's just four configurations that, uh, these, binary, that these terms can have. And the condition must be, if they are the same, so if you have 0, 0 next to each other, or 1, 1 next to each other, then this energy term must be 0. And if they are different, so 1, 0, and, or 0, 1, then it must be non-negative. So having two different neighbors next to each other must have a higher energy, or at least not lower, than having the same. Which, and since high energy means lower probability, that means neighbors are rather of the same label than of different labels. So this zero is also not the biggest issue. You can compensate by putting something else here. But the main thing is this kind of preference of equal configurations over non-equal configurations. That's the, that's the crucial part of a submodular energy. And many problems have that property. For image segmentation, for example, a foreground pixel is more likely to be next to a foreground pixel than to be to a background pixel. So this is a typical model you can use for image segmentation, for example. <coughs> OK. So why is, this, why is it possible to do um, minimization, finding the minimizing configuration in these models um, under these specific conditions? Because there are very nice equivalents out there that is that the minimization of such an energy can be, for, uh, can be performed by solving a classic um, graph theoretic problem. And the graph theoretic problem is the ST min cut. That means you have a graph, um, the full thing is a graph, one node you call the source, one node you call the sink. All the edges have weights. And now you know that there's a polynomial time algorithm for finding a cut through the graph, so one that cuts the edges such that there's two connected components afterwards. And there must be the sink in one of the connected components and the source must be in the other. So that means you must find a cut that prohibits any paths to exist between source and sink afterwards. And <clears throat> this is a known algorithm that can be computed, and we know it's polynomial. And there's a construction that turns the energy minimization problem into this kind of ST min cut problem, such that you can solve the ST min cut and then recover the optimal solution. And in fact, it's not very hard. You put your original graph in the middle, you add two additional nodes, um, which were not in the original graphical model, and then you put weights. Um, you read off the weights of your energy um, and put them to the edges of this graph. So the pairwise terms you put into this middle layer where the original graph of the graphical model leaves. And the unaries that uh, look only at one variable at a time, you use to connect the original graph to the source or to the sink. Uh, 
And if you look up the extract values and then you check what is the criterion for um, having a cut in this graph and so on, you will see that it's equivalent to making an assignment of every node to either the source or to the sink. So if you cut the edge to the source, then this weight belongs to the sink and vice versa. And that is, uh, you can recover if it had state zero as state one. <coughs> so that is, um, it's a very nice thing. And it's uh, one of the most efficient ways we have these days in order to do energy immunization for graphs with loops. So if you can write it in some way as a, not an arbitrary energy, but one with submodular interactions, then typically you're on the safe side and you can actually still do stuff exactly. <coughs> okay. Um, that was exact. You really get the optimal configuration of states. Okay, the loop PBP was not, but the graph cut version of the previous slide was. Um, another method that can give you exact um, solutions is a very general one. You can rewrite your minimization over states into an integer linear optimization problem and then feed that into an integer linearization optimization package. So imagine you have an energy that consists of these terms. Um, so the probability would be e to the minus net. Um, there can be variables with more than two states, so this graph cut trick doesn't work. You can also have higher order factors that have the more than two inputs. So again, non-submodular. Or you have binary terms and, and binary variables, but some of the factors are not submodular, so you also cannot apply the previous trick. You can still write it as a linear integer optimization, um, which unfortunately in general are also NP-hard, but that doesn't mean you cannot solve at least some of the instances using the commercial packages. <coughs> so what's an integer linear program? It's an uh, optimization problem that has a linear objective function, it has linear constraints, and all the variables you optimize over are integer valued, and very often they are binary valued 0, 1. So how do you do that? Well, let's take this factor graph here, which has three uh, factors, one which looks only at y1, one which looks only at y2, and one which looks at both. And this variable has three st four states, so the factor has four entries. This variable has three states, so it has two, uh, three entries, and this looks at the four variable state and the three variable state at the same time, so it has 12 entries. We turn this into a linear program by introducing indicator variables. We just say, for each of these little boxes, we introduce a variable that is either zero or one, and we index it by the corresponding variable name. So we just say, um, here's, a here's a variable, it's one, if and only if this variable had the state number k. So there's as many, ver as many indicator variables as there is possible states, and the indicator tells you which of the states it was. We do the same here, one variable for each possible state, and we do the same here, one for each possible pair of states, so one variable for each box. Now, these are not independent of each other completely, because we know that if this variable takes a certain state, then it also has to take the corresponding state in the pairwise thing, right? So we have some constraints between these variables, and I'm not going to go through them, but these constraints are encoded here. In particular, if you sum over all the variables of one variable, it has to be exactly one, because, um, well, the variable has to be in one of the states, so if you sum over the indicators, it must sum to exactly one, namely the state that it is in. And the other is if you have, if you take this pairwise thing and you sum over a row, then you must get the outcome of the corresponding left, because if, it's, if this is in its second state, that means one of the states in the second row must have been active. And similarly, if you uh, sum this over columns, you must get the corresponding entry of this one, because if you were in this column, automatically this state was active, and so on. So there's linear constraints between the, the indicator variables. <coughs> Once you did that trick, however, you can write every energy function as a linear function in the indicator variables. So the original energy was these three terms. Um, now, these are functions of, I mean, these are just values, right? For every state y1, it has a certain value. So you can write this as the value that the energy would have had for that state multiplied with the indicator of that state actually being there. So for any z, you can write it um, Ah, okay. Here I just write it as the energy itself is a sum over terms which indicators. So state k, the value is a constant times the indicator of state k. Well, that is confusing. 
What you get is you can write any energy as a linear combination of indicators with some constant in front of them in a, by just enumerating all the states and looking at the value of the factor and multiplying it with the corresponding indicator. So now you have finally achieved your integer linear problem. You have massaged everything until you had a linear function with respect to the new unknown indicators. So just indicator variables summed with, with constant in front. This is a linear function. And then we do have some constraints. We know that this condition about stuff has to sum up to one. And we know about stuff that if you have the pairwise term, you sum over one dimension, you have to uh, get the outcome of the other. And we also have the constraint that the variables themselves, these indicators, must be binary valued, either 0 or 1. So this is an integer linear program. You can write these terms explicitly into a solver, and the solver will spit out a solution, either efficiently or inefficiently, but typically it does so um, well, well, either immediately or it takes forever. So. Okay, this also suggests a way to do efficient approximate inference. And that is so-called uh, relaxations. So the hard thing about this optimization is really not the linear constraints. Linear constraints, every step, I mean, all the time we deal with linear constraints. It's also not a linear objective. Linear objectives are really not hard. What's hard is that to achieve this minimization with integer constraints at the same time. So we cannot like put fractional values. We have to choose either 0 or 1. That makes it discrete, and discrete optimization is always hard. If this would not be there, if we wouldn't have integer constraints, it would actually be a very classic linear problem which is very efficient to solve. So this suggests a way to make it uh, much more efficient to solve. You just drop your integer constraints, replace them with box constraints. You say, now Z, it's an indicator, but it can be anywhere between 0 and 1. It doesn't have to be an integer anymore. <coughs> so that leaves more options for the minimization. And in fact, now it's a smooth interval, so you can even do gradient-based methods and so on. So now the optimization problem becomes tractable, and there's polynomial time algorithms instead of being NP-hard. You can keep all the constraints, right, because these were formulated. I mean, they work for integer as well as for uh, real valued. Okay, the one problem you have, if you solve this now, well, the solution that you get out might not be an integer, right, because we allow fractional values for the z, so um, this is a very, very schematic thing. If you solve the linear optimization problem and this gradient is meant to indicate that there is like a linear function going down or up, um, if you solve this only over the integer points, well, this point is not allowed, this point is not allowed, it's outside of the range. So there's just these two. This has a smaller value, so the optimal solution of the integer would be up here, just schematically. If you now allow fractional values, it will choose any fractional value, in not just the coordinate, just these dots. So it might choose a completely different value, which has a much because it has a smaller objective than the integer corner here. So you will get fractional solutions. Typically, what you do if you have a value of 0.2 instead of 0 or 1, you would round it. You would say, well, if it was 0.2, then most likely it really should have been 0. Um, but the answer to that is not necessarily optimal. So there's, uh, there's a whole literature of in which cases and how do you have to round in order to get globally optimal solutions from the fractional ones. But typically, if you don't have additional constraints, then rounding your solution will give you something reasonable, but it will not give you the global optimum. Um, that also makes sense because finding the global optimum is NP-hard. So if it would be so easy to just relax and then round, well, you would have solved P equals NP. Nevertheless, these LP relaxation, linear program relaxation can be used for approximate energy minimization. So we'll, you will get typically a good minimizer of your energy, even if it's not the globally optimal one. <coughs> okay, here's um, ah, another thing that happens is many of the solutions can actually be integer valued. So it's often the case that you do get 0, 1, and in some cases, you can prove that if you do get 0, 1, these were actually the optimal values at that point. Sometimes you cannot prove that, but typically you trust them more than if you would get 0.5, right? So here's an illustration where the goal was some kind of simple image processing task solved by an integer linear program, relaxed to a linear program, and the red places is where it was uncertain about the answer and it returned 1 half, and for the other places it returned either 0 or 1. So it was certain 
it gave you an integer solution almost everywhere except at this small point here and over here. Here's an example where the same was used for stereo reconstruction and there it was much more uncertain. So there's large regions, in fact all the interesting regions that are right at the object boundaries where it didn't want to decide. So instead of assigning 0 or 1, it just assigned 1 half and said, you make the decision, I don't know. Um, so that's not a very helpful example. Here, I guess, it would have been pretty easy to, to deal with these with roundings or other, another method. Okay. Um, finally, <coughs> these fractional solutions can be annoying. Imagine you get, you set up your problem, you write an optimization, you run into, a, I mean, put it into some toolbox for linear optimization, and what you get out is every variable is one half. So you didn't learn anything. That can be highly frustrating. So there's also a certain direction of approximate energy minimization where you, um, you try to not to re increase the number of possible solutions, but you reduce it. For the integer linear program, we allow more solutions that we really care about, right? We allow fractional values instead of just integer ones. That makes it easier, it has more wiggle room to search, but it means we might end up outside of the set we really care about. Instead, you can do local search, which does, it reduces the amount of legal configurations, but every configuration you will get is at least one that you can interpret and that doesn't have any kind of weird one-half values or so. So how does local search work? <coughs> Think of this curly Y as the space of all possible configurations. You start at an arbitrary location. Now instead of, I mean, you look for the global minimum after overall, but maybe you cannot see it because who knows where it is. So you only look in a local neighborhood and maybe you can find out what is the smallest value in that local neighborhood. So from the current point, you go to the minimum in that local neighborhood. Then you pick, it, pick another neighborhood around the current best, so, and so on and so on. And in the end, you end up with a point where even if you look at the neighborhood of that point, you do not find a better solution anymore, and then you say it's converged. This looks a little bit like gradient descent, except you do not do these steps based on gradients, you do these steps based on like a, a neighborhood search without gradient. It's a discrete space, you cannot do gradients. Okay, so the maze, most easy way of doing that, um, reminds a little bit of this Gibbs sampler I showed before, is so-called ICM, Iterated Conditional Modes. Um, it's a very classic method. Um, sometimes it even works remarkably well. Again, it's very, very easy to implement. So <coughs> what do you do? Well, you have a cu current configuration. Um, now the neighborhood you look at is, you just pick one random variable and check if other values at that location are better. So you just pick one, and you check, if I relabel this one point, does my energy get better? If it does, I accept the point, I continue. If not, well, I choose the next. Maybe if I change this one, I get better. And until you reached, tried all of them, now you've tried all of them. If for none of them you could get better by changing its values, you have found some kind of local minimum. But if you were able to find a better one, you go to the better one of those. Again, you keep everything except one, and so on and so on. And that way you make small steps, but every step will improve your energy a little bit, and ultimately you might find a good solution. <coughs> um, so the, the crucial thing is, in all of these search procedures, what is the, the neighborhood you search over at this point? And in this case, it's just the set of all states you can change by one change at a time. Um, the good thing about that is, if it's just one change at a time, you can find the minimum exhaustive search. You just try all values. That's, I mean, a very small operation. So you know that within this neighborhood, you can actually minimize the function efficiently. On the other hand, um, that means the moment that you could only get a better energy by changing two things at a time, you will not find it, right? So it would be better if you could search over larger neighborhoods, not just one variable at a time, but more variables at a time. So um, if you do just the back of the envelope calculation, uh, calculation um, this ICM up here, the, number, the neighborhood size is linear in the number of nodes of your graph, right? Because it's the number of nodes of your graph times the state space. So the space you're overall searching over is exponentially in the size of your graph. 
So that means you will need a lot of iteration steps before you actually explore all the configurations, or rather you will never explore all configurations, you will get stuck before. Um, so it would be much nicer if you could define a neighborhood that is much bigger, maybe even exponential in the graph size, but we can still search efficiently over it. Right? That would be ideal. And it turns out in many cases, or at least in one case, um, you can still do that. Um, <coughs> and that is based on the insight we had before that the graph cut algorithm can actually search over all configurations of binary variables efficiently. So this is, the number of configurations is two to the number of variables you have, right? This is exponentially in the size of the graph, but still you can find the global minimum efficiently. So alpha expansion is a popular method to do that um, if you have well, it's very popular in computer vision algorithms, but it's also in other settings where you can reduce it to this specific situation. So you're given an energy, it has terms on one variable, it has terms on two variables at a time, as we had before. But now it's not just binary variables, it can be any number of variables, let's say 1 to k. Um, so we want to do some kind of multi-class graph labeling. Every node of a graph should get one out of k labels. <coughs> The typical example of that is the semantic segmentation I talked a while ago. Every pixel in the image should be assigned one out of 20 different classes. That's a very typical example of these kind of multi-class graph labeling problems. Um, the natural language processing, the position tagging is also like that. Every word in the should be one out of the part of speech tags. So it's, it's actually a quite common situation. So here's the alpha expansion algorithm. Let's go through it. Um, it works exactly the same way as we had for the neighborhood search. We start with an initialization and then we repeat until we have converged. For every possible value alpha, which is one of these labels, we construct a neighborhood. The, um, given the current configuration, we have to construct a neighborhood to search over, right? So this is the neighborhood construction. Um, we define a new problem which has as many labels as the original but now it has binary things. It can only say, it only has, each variable is only two choices. Either stay where you are, so the variable y that we search over is the same as it was, or switch to label alpha. So stay as you are, switch to alpha. That's the two options for every individual variable, but we allow every pixel, every variable to decide individually. So in the end, it's as many pixels, two to the number of variables, many uh, configurations that we can reach this way. <coughs> now we want to minimize over this neighborhood the energy. How can we do that? Um, well, we have now a binary problem, and we know that over binary problems with these pairwise interactions, we can search efficiency if the energy is submodular. And the nice thing is we can check these conditions, and it turns out if the original pairwise terms are metric, meaning they are non-negative, they are symmetric, and they fulfill the triangular inequality, then the energy we get for this neighborhood relation is a submodular energy. Putting all of that together, you can search over the neighborhood efficiently, you can explore a large part of the configuration space because you search in each step over an exponentially large subspace of it. Um, even better, you get a theorem that tells you the solution you get from this. It's not the globally optimal one necessarily, but it's at least not arbitrarily bad. So you can prove that the solution that you get by this will have an energy not worse than twice the optimal energy. Or rather, there is another constant C, which is um, depending on what your pairwise terms look like. But in the easiest case, where the pairwise terms are all the same, you will get that the energy you find is not more than twice the best possible. So that is, um, it's, it might not be enough, but it's a good thing to have that at least you're not completely far off. Okay, so this is the example I showed. Um, this is the so-called POTS model. It's a very popular model for image segmentation. You have each pixel itself, the label you decide, has some kind of factor attached to it that is how likely is a certain label for example, given the color of a pixel, green most likely grass, brown most likely cow. This is a one pixel interaction. And there we have a second term that compares neighboring labels and it's either zero or one, depending on these are the same or not. 
So this is the generalization of the um, submodular one to more than two labels. You can check the terms and you will find out that you will get exactly this factor two approximation guarantee. Okay, another example is stereo. What if you have two images and you want to find the depth based on perspective projection, uh, I mean triangulation essentially, um, you write an energy that says this pixel and this pixel should belong together if they are, uh, yeah, I mean, which pixel belongs to which pixel. And then you have another term that measures the distance between the two in terms of a disparity. If you do that thing, you get, um, it, it is metric, you can apply this alpha expansion technique. The guarantees you get are not particularly good, but it's still uh, better than not being able to do anything. Okay, so that's the summary of energy minimization. What are we trying to do? Given a, a probability distribution, find the maximally likely state, or given an energy function, find the minimum energy state, is equivalent. Um, for tree models and um, chains and so on, we can do belief propagation variant. For submodular energies, we can do a graph cut. There is a version of the junction train algorithm also for these, but it's too uh, intractable usually to run. Um, for general graphs, we can do linear programming, and there's many approximate techniques. We talked about linear program relaxation, ICM, alpha expansion, um, and it's a very active field of research. Every year you will find 10 new methods that either come up with a new algorithm or with a very specific situation. They say, if these are the form of our potentials, then we can make use of this trick and maybe we can use another graph algorithm than just the min cut and so on. So that will, um, there's constantly expanding literature on how to do this efficiently. And I think that would be the last section, so let's make another break for five minutes. <laughs>